uh, lecture talk uh, on China and the Gulf. We rarely hear on this topic and we have an authority here. Um, so this is part of the uh, SOAS East Institute uh, weekly uh, seminars, lectures, book launches that we've started this year, obviously on this platform given the COVID situation. But we are delighted, and uh, just to introduce myself briefly before I introduce our guest, I'm Dina Matar, I'm uh, a member of SOAS and the SOAS Middle East Institute, and I'm also the chair of the Center for Palestine Studies, which sits within the uh, SMEI. And so uh, I'm quickly going to introduce uh, Professor Jonathan Fulton, who is going to give us the talk. He is currently in the United Arab Emirates, where he presumably it's around 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock in the evening. So it's quite late for him. So thank you so much for making uh, the extra effort to be here with us. Um, uh, Jonathan is Assistant Professor of Politics at uh, the University of uh, Zayed University in the United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi. He is in the Humanities and Political Science uh, Department or College, I think it's called that. Um, he's a senior non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council and he has written widely in various publications on um, the relations between uh, the Gulf uh, region and China, but may maybe more broadly he can uh, tell us more about uh, his interest in China um, uh, as well. And he is the publisher of two books. They came out successively, one in 2019 and just recently in 2020. The one in 2019 is called China's Relations with the Gulf Monarchies and 2020 Regions in the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so the format of this talk will be, uh, uh, I think, 40 minutes discussion, talk, lecture, uh, whichever way but um, you know you might go Jonathan you might want to take some more time so we are uh, giving you the space to do that we have altogether one and a half hours um, and then basically what we request of our attendees is to put the questions there's a question and answer button on your screen on the zoom screen just put your questions there and I will collect them and take them in and also uh, I'm sure that Jonathan will pay attention to them and we also have uh, questions that might come from the Facebook, uh, people attending via Facebook, and they would be collected and then we will put them in the chat uh, and then we'll answer all your questions. Um, without further ado, we would like to welcome you to SOAS, really the virtual SOAS at the moment, uh, but we're all doing things virtually and we're really, uh, really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Dina. Um, thank you very much. So thanks for uh, hosting this event. Uh, I've been wanting to get to SOAS for a long time, so it's a pity it's it's via my my home office. But hopefully, uh, things will change someday, inshallah, and I can can get there in person. It's really great to see a lot of familiar faces in the participant list here. Um, this is, I guess, the cool way we get to visit with each other these days. Um, and thanks for coming because I know everybody's got a lot of entertainment options today. Uh, obviously, we can all be, I've been watching Twitter nonstop. I can't take my eyes off it. Um, I've set a bunch of different alerts on my phone so I can find out what crazy things are gonna happen to our friends in the US today. Um, yeah, very interesting stuff. So yeah, as, as Dina said, I, um, I research China Gulf relations. I'm based in Abu Dhabi in the UAE. I've been here since 2006. Um, and before I came here, I spent about 10 years in, in East Asia, where I studied Chinese in, in Taiwan um, for a few years, and then I went to Korea, where I was teaching as well. Um, and I found when I moved here, mostly what my interest was, was just learning more about a region that really hadn't really fe uh, featured very much in my, my awareness of global politics, except like everybody uh, my age, knowing that the Middle East is a pretty important place, but I hadn't traveled here, I didn't know much about it. So like many people who come to the Gulf, I thought I was coming for, for a three-year contract and I learned something about the place and then move on. And, and now 14 years later, uh, I seem to be stuck. Um, but it's been lucky for me the time I've been here because it's been a very, very interesting vantage point to watch uh, the expansion of China's presence across Eurasia and the Indian Ocean region. Um, I started working on my PhD 
I think it was 2011, 2012, something like that. And I knew that I wanted to focus on China Gulf relations. Um, and I remember talking to some folks here in Abu Dhabi and just saying, look, this, I'm, I'm gonna write about this. And I remember uh, an economist who works here in, in, in Abu Dhabi saying, there's no way you're gonna get 100,000 words on this topic, man. There's, there's just not enough there. And by the time I wrapped it up, um, late 2016, uh, we had seen the, the, the story had changed quite a bit. And a big part of that, of course, was that China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative had led to a much bigger um, set of interests that went across the region. Uh, this is something I've been tracking quite a bit, um, is how the Belt and Road Initiative is, is shaping China's foreign policy, how it's shaping its economic relations, the, the normative components as, as the, um, some of the other features of this, uh, you know, you can look at it as a series of, of infrastructure projects and trade and, and investment, but this stuff isn't politically neutral. It comes with, with normative components as well. Um, and, and in the Middle East, a lot of countries are very interested uh, in, in how China might be able to help them deal with some of these uh, political and developmental issues as a, as a counterpoint to the way that Western countries have done it. So it's, it's a very interesting set of relations. Um, as, as Dina said, I'm, I'm a political scientist, I'm an IR guy, and um, I don't want to go too heavy into the theory, but typically when I look at any country's relations with the, with the Gulf countries, I think a useful starting point is to look at uh, Barry Buzan's work on regional security complexes. Um, and the reason for this is because a lot of the narratives that we're seeing right now coming out mostly out of the US, um, a lot of the narratives are about this great power competition between China and the US. And that seems to dominate the thinking of how a lot of folks perceive uh, political events in, in, around the world, but especially in the Middle East. Uh, you know, a great example of this is the Abraham Accords, which if you read just the New York Times and the Washington Post, this was just the result of the US diplomacy. Uh, but talking to folks in the region, uh, it seems that a lot of the motivation was working with regional actors who maybe share similar views of, of what the Middle East, they would like the Middle East to look like. Uh, and, and if the US was able to facilitate this in some way, then great. But uh, it really kind of strips the local actors of agency by saying, yeah, this is a, a triumph of, of American diplomacy, because really, I think this is something that um, any number of publications over recent years will tell you. Uh, these countries have been lining up much more closely uh, for, for the past several years, and this wasn't really a surprise to anybody. Uh, and how this relates to regional security complex is that most countries in a competitive region like the Gulf in particular, or the Middle East in general, are motivated more by their own neighbors. When they're thinking about security issues or foreign policy issues, they're not thinking about these systemic issues like you know, uh, US-China competition or the Belt and Road versus the free and open Indo-Pacific. They're thinking about each other first and foremost. So, you know, in the UAE, when, when decision makers are, are looking at their foreign po uh, policy calculus, they're not thinking about China-US competition, they're thinking about Iran, or they're thinking about Qatar, or they're thinking about Turkey. And if China and the US feature, it's mostly kind of in this omni-balancing approach where how can I use the involvement of these external powers to get what I need, either to protect my own regime or to protect my regional interests. Uh, and I think that's important because um, to, to come back to China, a, a lot of folks look at uh, this region, look at the Gulf and think, how is it possible that China can kind of sit on the fence so successfully for so long? Uh, a, a more traditional view is that an extra regional power uh, that has these kind of leadership ambitions would follow a more traditional role like the US has and kind of act like a, a, a traditional power, maybe an active balancer um, trying to set the regional framework by saying we're going to work with certain countries and against other countries in order to uh, preserve a status quo that we find preferable. Um, so we haven't seen China do that. And it's kind of got a lot of people uh, befuddled. When is China going to start acting like the US, when is it going to pick a side? And I think that's a, a very interesting question, but I also think it's kind of a misguided one because I think China doesn't really see it in the same way that the US does. Uh, the US has a lot more history. They've got a lot more baggage in, in the Gulf than China does. 
Um, and I think that there are also certain expectations of how China, uh, how the U.S. has to behave. And China's not uh, a regional leader. It doesn't have ambitions to be a regional leader. It seems quite satisfied to be at that second tier level um, of extra regional powers. And uh, that provides them with certain opportunities. And one of them is they're not expected to uh, use their leverage in certain ways. They don't have to make these hard alignment decisions or, or um, kind of uh, support a, a status quo. They seem pretty satisfied to, to kind of confront the region as they found it, whereas the, the US has kind of traditionally tried to reshape it uh, or, or to deal with it, uh, I, I guess, to, to, to form it in the way that, that supports their interests a little more uh, overtly. Um, so this has been pretty interesting. I mean, typically extra regional powers, whether they're, you, you, you see different approaches. If, if you're looking at countries that are US partners or allies, like Japan or Korea or India or the UK or, or EU, typically, except for certain situ situations like the, the invasion of Iraq, you would find that they, they typically will bandwagon you know, with the US on, on most issues of Gulf security because they get most of what they need by you know, following US leadership. Um, China has not bandwagoned. Uh, they're, they're not just following the US um, and, and they have reasons for this. I think the US uh, obviously would prefer this. You, you've seen when, when uh, President Obama derided China as a free rider in 2015, I believe, and said, you know, China should be making provisions. But really what he was saying is China should follow our leadership to support a status quo that we prefer. Um, and, uh, and I think Chinese leaders have maybe a, a different vision of what the Gulf should look like, um, especially with regards to Iran, which I guess is, is what I'm coming, coming to in, in kind of a roundabout way, is um, the China-Iran relationship is, is important to understanding its, its presence in the Gulf. But I really do think that it's really uh, gets, gets overblown or overhyped in a lot of the analysis of what China's doing here. And uh, so I'll, in my talk here tonight, I'll, I'll uh, offer some, some of my thoughts about why this China-Iran relationship isn't as, as important as we think, although we still do have to consider it as a pretty important pillar of its, of its Gulf presence. Um, before we can get into China and what it's doing here, we have to kind of address the, the, the baseline of everything that's happening here. And the baseline is that there's a lot of insecurity about US intentions in the region. And, this is often portrayed as a response to the personal preferences of, of, of a particular leader. You know, Obama wants this or Trump wants that or Bush wants something else. Um, I think that a, a better way of looking at this is to see it as um, not that Obama wants to pull out or Trump wants to pull out. I think it's more of a, a structural feature of an asymmetrical alignment or an, an asymmetrical relationship. Um, this alliance security dilemma that... Uh, that Snyder wrote so eloquently about uh, many years ago really resonates in the Gulf. And it's not a new thing. I, I, was, I was working on a paper recently and I was reading a book that was published right after Desert Storm. So the point at which the US had finally kind of cemented its, its regional presence as, a, as an active balancer, um, signed all these defense cooperation agreements with all of the Gulf monarchies except Saudi. Um, and one of the things that kept coming up in this book that was published at that time was how Gulf leaders were very concerned about America's ongoing commitment to Gulf security. Um, so this isn't you know, a new thing. Gulf leaders have always worried. This, this fear of abandonment has been a, a, a fundamental feature of the US Gulf or GCC relationship really from the beginning. Now, it's gotten more, it's gotten more prevalent in recent years. We've seen this, um, you know, after the, the invasion of Iraq and the, the disastrous occupation and all the, the awful stuff that came of this, um, we saw US under Obama pursue a different regional policy. And for Gulf leaders, this looked like an exit policy. When he talked about the, the, the rebalance or the pivot to Asia, this seemed like you, you don't pivot, you know, you, you, you pivot away from something. This seemed like you, you wanna get out of the Gulf. Um, and, and this is true because because Obama officials were saying we're going to redirect our resources, diplomatic, security, financial, technological, whatever, towards East Asia, which is where most of our economic future probably lies. 
Uh, so of course, golf leaders saw this and, and they took it at face value. Oh, this thing we've always worried about, it's a real thing. Um, and then you saw the, the Obama administration's response to the Arab uprising, specifically uh, to uh, Hosni Mubarak's regime and, and how um, he was kind of quickly abandoned. And of course, a lot of leaders throughout the region said, man, if, if, if that's been your most important regional ally basically since the Shah, and you could uh, cast him aside that easily, you know, we've got to make provisions for, for uh, you know, this happening to us too. And the JCPOA is another example where, where the, the US was negotiating with Iran and keeping the, the GCC countries out of it. So, you know, there was a lot of uh, concern here during the Obama years that, that the US commitment to the region was, was waning. And then we saw when Trump came in, and of course he made this, this, this big gesture with his trip to, to Riyadh as his first overseas trip. And everybody kind of said, oh, they're back on track. That was actually the banner headline in the Gulf News in Dubai the day of Trump's visit was US policy in the region back on track. Um, but since then, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of concern as well, uh, whether it's um, the, the US trying to uh, implement this Middle East Strategic Alliance, MISA, which really is, it just seems to everybody here as you're trying to get local actors to take a bigger role in, in security so you can minimize your role. Or when the Trump administration, or when the president would say, you know, I'm pulling out of Afghanistan, I'm pulling out of Syria, uh, we're leaving Iraq, all of these things kind of feed into this concern. So um, I, I think it's wrong to say this is because of a, of a particular president or an individual. I think it's just an ongoing concern. And I think it's, it's getting stronger. And I think it's affecting the foreign policy calculus uh, of, of three different sets of actors. Allies and partners of the US um, realize that this has always been an interest-based um, alignment. It's not always an alliance, but partnership, alignment, whatever it is. And we've seen American interests change over the years. And we're seeing that Gulf uh, actors are, are are recalibrating their foreign policy to, to make provisions for this, whether it's the UAE uh, adopting this more muscular regional foreign policy or, or Saudi and the UAE going into uh, uh, Yemen, or whether it's the UAE and Bahrain uh, normalizing relations with, with, with Israel. So we're seeing Gulf actors um, realizing that this interest-based rather than a values-based alignment is, is probably not as, as uh, permanent as, as folks would like. Um, this changes the foreign policy calculus of the Iranians, you know, because when, when the Trump administration pulled out of the JCPOA, there wasn't really an alternative strategy. The strategy was, let's leave the JCPOA and then maximum pressure. Um, but what does that mean as a policy? You know, uh, let's just try to create this stress that's going to uh, lead people to call for regime change. Um, for Iran, what that, what that has meant is uh, their response has been, of, of course, to get more aggressive, to think, what can we get away with? What is the red line for us? And what we've seen in the Gulf over the past couple of years was uh, they can get away with quite a lot, whether it's uh, you know, uh, mining tankers in the, the Gulf of Oman, or whether it's blowing up drones, or whether it's attacking Saudi Aramco. Um, in each of these cases, the U.S. response was nothing. Uh, it was only when uh, an American contractor was killed that Soleimani was killed. So I think everybody here looked at it and thought, yeah, the, you know, Iran is, is pushing the boundaries of what it can get away with. Uh, the value of deterrence maybe isn't what it used to be. And, um, you know, Iran has, has been acting uh, much more aggressively. Um, but again, to get back to the point of the talk, uh, at the third level, it affects the foreign policy of extra regional powers. Because again, with a lot of these countries that have been able to bandwagon under US preponderance, or uh, I'm not crazy about the idea of US hegemony, but, but certainly US military preponderance, uh, this, this has worked for a lot of countries. The UK, France, uh, the EU, you know, most Asian countries have been able to bandwagon with US policy and meet most of their regional needs. Uh, but then you have to think, well, in a world of America first, um, where American alliances are being stressed, um, maybe they also have to make considerations for a, a different type of regional um, presence. And of all of the countries um, that I think 
this features the most substantively, it's China, you know, um, and, and there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, we've seen, um, you know, countries like India increasing its presence here. It's got very important economic interests in the Gulf. It's got pretty dense ties. It's got cultural and, and uh, familial and, 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 you know, any number of, of, of uh, historical ties here at a much deeper level than most other Asian countries. Um, but it, it doesn't really seem to have an overarching strategy for securing its interests here. Whereas China, with this Belt and Road Initiative, seems to have not just a, a, a vision of Indian Ocean region, Eurasian connectivity, um, but very importantly, it's a positive vision of, of this connectivity. Uh, for Gulf actors, what everybody's been hearing in the Middle East, you know, for my entire lifetime, has been the Middle East is a problem that we have to solve. You know, if you listen to anybody in London or Washington or Ottawa or Paris or whatever, it's pretty rare that you hear somebody speak of the Middle East in positive terms. Um, when Gulf leaders hear China talk about the Middle East, it's Silk Road connectivity and, you know, the, the voyages of Zheng He and, and, you know, these, these, these ancient ties that go back over generations um, and, and a positive role that, that the Middle East will play in creating this, this uh, Belt and Road Initiative, the signature foreign policy of China. Uh, so so it, is, it does seem to have kind of a, a positive uh, strategy for how it sees the Middle East featuring in its, in its uh, I don't know if I'd say grand strategy, but it's in its foreign policy uh, across multiple regions. And of the Middle East, um, you have to differentiate because across different regions or diff across different countries, uh, of course, there are different policies. Uh, North Africa and the Levant, the, the economic relationship you see with China is kind of what you would expect. China sells a lot of stuff and it doesn't buy much stuff. They invest, but not heavily. Um, it's not really, um, it, it, it's an important economic actor for a lot of these countries, but those countries don't really mean much to China, uh, you know, uh, economically. Whereas the Gulf, that's very different. And it's not just about energy, although energy is a big part of that. Uh, but you'll see that the GCC countries and Iraq and Iran, um, the balance of trade is, is, is different here. You know, typically most of those countries sell a lot more stuff to China than they buy from China. Um, the the uh, exceptions have been the UAE, um, interestingly, and that's mostly because of the UAE's uh, re-export economy and it's, it's more, uh, excuse me, uh, I guess more mature post rentier model that they've been trying to develop here. And Bahrain is the other exception. That's just because Bahrain doesn't have much to sell. Um, but in most cases, um, you know, the, the economic relations are much more sophisticated and deeply entrenched. And it's not just based on trade, but also you see a lot of, of, of contracting, these uh, Gulf vision programs, Vision 2030 or, or, or new Kuwait 2035 or whatever lines up very closely with, with the Belt and Road Initiative's uh, ambitions, uh, these five cooperation policies of, of uh, trade and uh, infrastructure development and investment and people-to-people -people ties um, and, and policy coordination lines up very neatly with what a lot of the Gulf countries are trying to do. So the Gulf is the most important economic region for China in the Middle East. And it's also the most important geo geostrategic one. Um, again, uh, this is an important consideration. A lot of the time when people talk about China's relations with Iran and they say, you know, there's this land bridge that connects China and Iran, which makes Iran very important for the Belt and Road. But one of the things that we don't consider is to get from Western China into Iran, you have to pass through some sparsely populated, not very economically important Central Asian countries where China's economic ties are pretty minimal and where to build this cross-regional or intra-regional connectivity, you build railroads or highways, which are a lot more expensive um, to ship stuff and a lot less uh, efficient. So this, the Belt and Road, it's got these two um, components. There's the Overland Silk Road Economic Belt, and then there's the Maritime Silk Road Initiative, which is all these, these ports and industrial parks in free trade zones across the Indian Ocean region. And that is where the Arabian Peninsula fits. Um, you know, when the Belt and Road was announced 
way back in 2013, and all these maps started to appear. This is when, when the Gulf countries were kind of preoccupied with the Arab uprisings. Nobody really cared about the Belt and Road. But so, so the, the result was a lot of analysts looked at it and thought the Belt and Road doesn't feature on the Arabian Peninsula. But what we've seen is, is under this maritime Silk Road um, framework, that China's been investing a lot into ports in Abu Dhabi and in Dubai and in Gwadar and Pakistan and in Dukum and Oman in Jazan and Saudi and this military base in Djibouti and, and ports and industrial parks in Egypt. Um, when you look at it, they've created through these commercial investments, um, not strategic investments, not military bases, but, but very um, important commercial investments. It's kind of a horseshoe that goes from the Gulf region in Abu Dhabi um, along the Arabian Sea, up the Red Sea and into the Mediterranean. So cooperating with these countries on the Arabian Peninsula offers China quite a bit geostrategically as well. And that's something we have to consider when we, can, when we think about China's presence in the Middle East, is that it's the, the countries that it, it stands to gain the most from, economically and strategically, um, are, are, are Iranian rivals or Iran, Iranian enemies. And so you have to think that whatever Beijing is going to do, it's, it's not going to want to alienate those relationships for whatever marginal benefits that it would get from working with a revisionist country like Iran, which is completely isolated uh, within the region, you know, among states. I mean, it's got non-state relationships, but, you know, what's the benefit of cooperating with uh, Hamas or Hezbollah when you could be working with, you know, the UAE and the Saudis? Obviously, these things don't weigh uh, similarly. And, and just as an example of this, um, the, the importance of, of the Belt and Road and how this features um, is that when China, I, uh, I, I, from researching the Belt and Road, I've seen that there's two general types of projects you can see. There's projects that support a country's domestic um, development agenda. And then there are projects that, that kind of fit into this inter-regional or intra-regional connectivity. So for example, Chinese firms, these state-owned enterprises can go into Qatar and they can build the FIFA World Cup stadium and they can work on uh, port expansion and they can build a mega res reservoir. And those things are great for Chinese companies. But again, Qatar is, is isolated, you know? So those projects don't really connect to anything else. Um, it, it makes a profit for China and it helps China develop stronger relations with Qatar, but you know, Yahoo, what else do we get? When they go to Abu Dhabi and they pour billions of dollars into uh, the, the Khalifa port complex, that links them not just to Abu Dhabi, but to, to Dubai and to uh, Saudi and to Oman and to Egypt. You know, it, it fits into a larger um, network of countries that fits into this more um, connectivity narrative, which is driving a lot of the BRI. So you're not going to hear Chinese leaders say that one country is more important than another, or one Belt and Road project is more important than another. But if you look at it, it's quite clear it is. You know, these things that link up and, and kind of create a Chinese network, a, a, a commercial network and supply chains and business clusters, um, this actually creates, you know, the expansion of China's presence in the region in, in a much more um, useful way than you know, building a metro in Tehran, you know, or building a soccer stadium in, in, uh, in Qatar. Sorry, football stadium, my Canadian is showing. Um, so this is an important point because there's a, there's a perception um, that China is transactional and opportunistic in the Middle East. It's here to make a quick buck. The U.S. is strategic and it's never leaving and it's always going to, it's, it's building, you know, a, a sustainable presence, whereas China's just here you know, building cheap junk and selling cheap junk and, and trying to make a profit and leave. And I think this is a really short-sighted view of what's happening. Um, I think that China's actually been, been um, laying the groundwork for a much more long-term approach to, to, to its Middle East presence. Now, I'm not one of these guys, you'll, you'll, you'll see people writing these, these ridiculous books like the 100-year marathon, where they say, oh, these, these Chinese guys think in, in centuries, whereas Westerners think in election cycles. 
you know, this is, I think, quite a simplification of, 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 of how China is approaching it. But I do think that they're looking at the region in a much more integrated way than we tend to. Um, well, not we, maybe um, folks in the US, you know, I guess is what I'm getting at. Um, just in, in, in a lot of our academic disciplines as well, it's not just in, in government agencies, but you know, when we look, for example, as, as academics at say the Red Sea region, um, what we often see is there's the Middle East folks who look at the Arabian side of it, and then there's the African folks who look at, you know, the, 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 the other coast of it. And of course, I understand why it's a, it's a tough language. You know, you've got you've to approach different languages and different cultures and learn a lot of different history. So we kind of specialize, we silo off. Um, so the Mediterranean, we see it as the North and the South and there's North Africa and there's the Southern Europe. But when you look at these China, Chinese maps, there's the Mediterranean and these projects that are, are being developed um, in, in, the, in the, the port in, in Athens link up with the projects that are happening in Suez, which link up with the things that are happening in, in, in Morocco and Tunisia. So, you know, it kind of is, is looked at more as a, 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 a regional whole, I guess, is how I, how I describe it. And um, it does seem to be, I think, a pretty clever way of looking at, at, at developing a regional uh, presence. Now, um, to get back to this, this China-Iran GCC business, which I get I'm really taking the long way to this. Um, you know, when we look at China's presence in the Gulf, um, like most countries, it's it can't be looked at in isolation. It's 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 in it's relative to a lot of things, and and chief among those is the relationship with the U.S. Um, you can't say that there's this China Saudi relationship or a China Iran relationship and not also consider how the U.S. features in both of those. And um, again, looking at this from an IR perspective, China hasn't been bandwagoning with America, mostly because they, especially under the, the Trump administration, they have very deep disagreements with how the US has, has approached Iran. You know, China's spent quite a lot of diplomatic capital bringing the Iranians to the table to sign the JCPOA. In the two years in the run-up, there were something like 17 meetings between Chinese, you know, ministerial level officials and their Iranian counterparts. Um, kind of dragging them to the, to the finish line using carrots and sticks. You know, the carrots are, we're going to do a lot more investment in your country if you start acting like a normal country. Uh, the stick is, if you don't sign this deal, do you really think we're going to sacrifice, you know, $400 billion worth of trade with the US so we can trade with you, you know? Um, so there's always been that, that extreme leverage that China has over Iran. And I think Iran resents this deeply, but they, they don't have anybody else to turn to. Um, and China's made it very clear, you know, we, we, we'll work with you, we'll support you, but up to a point, we're not going to sacrifice our relationship with the US. Uh, whenever the US has introduced sanctions, uh, Chinese firms have complied. Um, they might try to, you know, buy oil in a, you know, a sneaky third party route or something, but, most of the financial infrastructure that facilitated Sino-Iranian trade is gone. Um, most of the stuff that China was doing in Iran, they're not doing anymore. Um, trade, I, I saw something earlier today uh, from last year, um, or for this year, for the first eight months of this year compared to last year, you know, China-Iran trade or exports, Iranian exports to China have dropped 62% from the same period last year. Basically, they're buying nothing from Iran anymore. Um, and they're buying a lot of stuff from Saudi. So when Iranian oil went off the market, that was 7% of China's oil. Um, the Saudis said, hey, we can make up that difference. You know? And China said, great. They, they, they started developing stronger energy relations with Saudi. So um, I think what we see is a lot of folks in the West and a lot of folks in DC have politicized this China-Iran relationship um, I, I really do believe it's a political um, discussion. I don't think it's it's I don't think it's real. We saw this happen in July, when um, when China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi was meeting with uh, his counterpart uh, Javad Zarif, and all these stories started breaking, and, and, and a lot of newspapers saying, 
25 year strategic partnership, military cooperation, arms sales, transfer of technology, $400 billion worth of Chinese investment into Iran. Um, and it was really presented as, oh my God, this block of revisionist powers are going to create this alliance that will threaten America's uh, interests in the Middle East. And um, some of the folks I see on the participant list have, have written pretty eloquently about this um, already, but you know, anybody who's been tracking that relationship, the China-Iran relationship, has, has really, it's, it's been a massive eye roll when we hear this stuff, because for one thing, China's not investing $400 billion anywhere. Um, Iran can absorb $400 billion worth of investment. Um, China has a non-alliance policy, and they have since 1982. They just don't do it. They have partnerships, um, which is another important point. This partnership that broke, the news that broke this July, was announced in January 2016 about three days after China signed the same partnership agreement with the Saudis. So it wasn't really a new thing. And if you look at the two things, so when China signed this partnership agreement with Iran, again, January 2016, this is right after the JCPOA was signed. This was China saying, you've made steps towards normalcy and here's a reward. We're going to show you the benefits of not being this, this uh, revisionist disruptive country. Uh, Xi Jinping became the first head of state to visit Iran after the JCPOA. Um, but almost immediately after Trump was elected and it became quite clear that the US was going to pursue a different track with Iran and that partnership never really took off. You know, they've, they've had lots of meetings. They, they, they rhetorically support each other, but China's done very little in, in, in real terms to support Iran uh, materially, um, financially and, and, and anything. At the same time, if you look at the trajectory of the, the Saudi-China uh, st Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, uh, again, signed the same week, they've, they've developed a very sophisticated mechanism to drive this forward. Um, they've got um, the Chinese Vice Premier, you know, one of the top officials in the country is the co-chair of this, uh, they call it the joint or the high level joint committee uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is a Saudi counterpart. They meet every year to drive this relationship forward. There are tangible material benefits to this partnership with the Saudis. Uh, they signed a similar one with the UAE in 2018, and it's already far surpassed whatever China's been able to do with Iran. Uh, the same thing, um, Yang Jiechi, who used to be the Chinese foreign minister, is on the state council. He's one of the top officials in the country. Um, he is the go-to guy for the UAE relationship. Um, and the UAE has appointed uh, Khaluna Mubarak uh, the, as their presidential envoy to China. So the same thing, they have, a, a, they have a, 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 a mechanism to build this forward. They have joint investment funds. They have, um, they're working on free trade agreements. They've got cultural exchanges, they're, they're learning Chinese in, in public schools. Um, what Iran has is at this point, nothing. I mean, a lot of the stuff that came out of this story that, that we saw in July was reported last September from a, a, a magazine called Patrolling Economy and almost everybody uh, debunked it immediately. Um, there, there was really very little, um, that could be that could be proven of it. And again, um, when you look at the, the 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 leak that came from this supposed agreement, this 25 year cooperation agreement, uh, this was leaked by the Iranian side, probably by Iranian politicians who are trying to create some division between Iran and China, because there's a lot of folks in Iran who don't want a closer relationship with China. They don't want to be so reliant on, on China. Um, so it really does seem to be an overwrought thing. And I think it seems to be driving a lot of the analysis of what's happening in the Middle East. Um, as, as soon as that came out, we, we started seeing a lot of op-eds. We saw a lot of analysis, a lot of think tank op, um, events talking about this new alliance between China and Iran. And I think really, if you look at it carefully, if you look at the trade figures, if you look at investment, if you look at contracting, the relationship that China has with US allies and partners just completely overwhelms anything that it has with Iran. Just uh, numbers that I throw out often uh, in 2019, according to the IMF, 
trade with uh, China and the GCC was worth $170 billion. I get that the GCC is maybe not the best uh, measurement of anything anymore, but trade with those six, six countries that generally have pretty negative impressions of Iran was worth $170 billion. Trade with Iran was worth $19 billion. So really, if, if Chinese leaders or Chinese state-owned um, enterprises are, are looking at the Gulf and they think, who are we going to, um, you know, where are we going to plant our flag? It's not Iran. Um, and, and this is interesting because I think if we saw the U.S. take a more, a less politicized, less great power competition narrative, you know, you can look at the South China Sea or you could look at South Asia and you could see legitimate concern, whereas China and, and American interests maybe diverge to a point where they could be competition could could go to a higher level. But in the Middle East, really their interests line up very, very, very closely. And it's something that I think you, you, it doesn't really get discussed a lot, but what China wants in the Middle East is very similar to what America wants in the Middle East. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for, for these two countries to actually cooperate on some of these things if they could put the politics aside. And I realize that's a big, you know, that's a big if especially today. Um, but again, if you look at a lot of the US um, policy documents that have been issued in the past few years, so there was the, um, the National Security Council in, in December 2017 rolled out, um, what was it, the, the National, National Security uh, Strategy. And the whole thing was basically a containment strategy where the Indo-Pacific is meant to contain China. And, and it referred to the BRI as a, you know, like a, a normative threat to American interests, and it was going to overturn this this free liberal order that that the U.S. has championed, which maybe is also kind of a simplification of of you know how how Asian countries might see Western involvement in those regions. Uh, and then the State Department also issued a very aggressive document in 2018, um, also kind of like a containment strategy against China. Um, I don't believe Democrats are any more favorably predisposed to thinking of China as a potential uh, partner. But I do believe that they might consider diplomacy rather than the military as their only foreign policy tool. And if that's the case, we might see more opportunities for dialogue, for, for, for you know, just actually trying to understand what is it that, that we want to achieve in this region and how is it that our interests might actually support this. So, um, I could I could go on I would go on but I, I can I'm looking at the clock and I, I would actually like to you know have some more conversation about this and hear what what you know uh, some of the folks in the audience might think so so maybe I'll stop here but uh, thanks for for listening this long if if you've managed to thank you uh, thank you very much uh, Jonathan uh, maybe um, I'll give. The first question, Nagis Fezat, whom uh, I should introduce as, as being uh, the other host of the talks and a key member of the SMEI, and is the chair of the Center for Iranian Studies. So, Nagis, do you have any comment, question, particularly because of, you know, your, in, you know, your work on Iran? And I Yes, for all the, yeah, yes, quite a lot, um, but um, obviously I won't hog the line, line. Thank you very much, Professor Fulton. Really very interesting, very interesting to see the, um, hear the views of an observer from the other side of the Persian Gulf. It was very interesting. I was thinking that maybe in general, in dealing with China, one needs to perhaps revisit the history of the country and then the, uh, you know, history is, of interaction, you know, going back to the time of empire, of course, you know, Iran's relations with China go back to at least 200 BC during the time of Parthians and the Hans. And it was the Persians that time who actually facilitated a passage through Kushan for Buddhism to actually get to China and so on and so forth. And then the Sasanians and the first wall that was built, you know, the Gorgon wall, which is by the Caspian Sea was really to keep the Huns out. And that's when they took their eyes off the Western Front and you know, never feared the Arab tribes um, in the seventh century. 
And so this, you know, ebb and flow of relations, I mean, Iran is in a different category. I don't think Iran envisages that, you know, with a hip, sort of 5,000 year history, this is just a bleep, the 40 years of competition with the United States or, you know, battles with it, being cornered by the United States is nothing very significant. This shall pass. And um, uh, it's, um, you know, I was thinking that if all things were the same, Iran would probably much rather be in the back in the lap of the West. Of course, West doesn't have that money anymore. There was a time, I mean, if we spoke about this sort of 12 months ago, perhaps uh, um, United States or EU would have the will or the finances to stop this, to you know, invest perhaps further in the global South. I mean, this is where China is looking at it. If you look at that road and belt, it is, you know, Singapore, it's Djibouti, as you said, you know, going up through Suez and um, uh, Latin America as well. It's, it's just, um, you know, I mean, I don't know, you, you said that this, you know, perhaps it's not so serious, this uh, relationship between Iran and China, and you're quite right, it was Ahmadinejad who, you know, made sure everyone knew, and the MPs in the Iranian parliament who were very alarmed by China, probably because of a much longer history, you know, going all the way to, you know, the Uyghurs, Uyghurs, as you call them. So it's, um, it would be very interesting to see what um, if, if the oil wasn't there, I mean, I don't know what the benefit of um, reliance on China is. Who, who was it? They had the saying that, what was it, the Don Ping saying, what is that, you know, hide your capacity and bide your time. Um, and I think this is probably China's strategy. This Iran will be a useful ally, partner, ally maybe it's too much at the moment, a facilitator of various things, as it did the Mahan airline who allowed Chinese citizens to fly in and out of China. And of course, you know, the rest of Middle East was horrified because the COVID spread through these flights, etc. But it's an extraordinary time to watch that region. I think I'm much, as you said, much more interested in the uh, belt than the road. The road has been there. The original Silk Road was very much, you know, really 200 BC between Iran and uh, China. And it's, um, um, I think Iranians do not want to be beholden to China. They hate mm. their markets being flooded by third rate Chinese goods. And I don't know whether that will happen to the other side of water, the wealth of Saudis, they probably don't need to buy the third rate <laughs> products. But it would be fascinating to see what effect this will have on the more regional relations. And Qatar obviously is nowhere near any of these roads or belts. So that probably have to be a reliance. But I think perhaps enough, I mean, I'm sort of mulling over and listening to all that you said, trying to digest it, but it's a very timely talk and very interesting time, simply, I think, because China has the money and the counterbalance doesn't because the West is going to be just so, in, you know, out of pocket um, dealing with the COVID consequences. And so the road is open to China and its investments in the global South. Yeah, well, I think, thanks uh, for your comments. I think thinking about the Iranian leadership's distaste of, of closer cooperation with China, I mean, a lot of the way that this, this partnership was being framed was really a, um, a new dependency. And to think of everything the Iranian people have struggled with to, to have this, you know, post-revolutionary, fiercely independent um, approach to global politics, and then to say, yeah, yeah, we're just going to throw our lot in with China and, you know, it's just not going to happen, right? So it's it's going to be very interesting to, to see how this plays out in the region. Um, I think a big part of it is also the normative element, because as I said, this values-based versus interest-based approach, um, I, I spoke with somebody from a Western um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs who was saying, you know, the Gulf Arabs 
are more closely aligned with us in terms of values, right? Like they, 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 they like us in what we represent more than what China does. And I'm sorry, man, uh, no, no. I mean, liberal democracy is not really what people wanna buy here. And, and the China model is much more attractive for a lot of leaders and a lot of societies too, I, I think. So there is, um, it is a pretty fundamentally important shift I think. Oh, thank you. So uh, I'm just going to ask a very simple question and then take and also put forward a question from uh, Steve Tang. We're getting questions coming in quite uh, quickly. So when you talk about the Gulf, um, you know, you're talking, are you talking about the Gulf Cooperation Council countries? And what do you mean by the Gulf? Is it like Saudi Arabia being the main leader? So in a sense, the term Gulf, um, is kind of homogenizing a region uh, that has, uh, you know, different states with different structures, different economies, uh, interests, and so on. Um, and we all know about, you know, the, 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 the vying for the leadership between the UAE and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, over the past decade. Um, but that's my question. And I'll put forward the questions from uh, uh, Steve. And there's one question in the, uh, from the audience also related to that, which is, um, you know, what are the strategic interests of the Gulf states in relation to China? And is that uh, the reason why the Gulf, yeah, why do they are welcoming a stronger presence in, in the Gulf? But in relation to that, is that, you know, can you comment briefly on the silence uh, over the treatment of the Uyghurs and, um, and, you know, the silence from the Muslim world around that? Um, and if that factors in your uh, discussion, I mean, I understand it might not be part of what you are talking about, but if you could comment at least. Sure. Briefly. That's a lot. <laughs> um, so the Gulf, I mean, it, it's interesting because, like I said, um, there's a sense that China's got this neutral approach. And I think this is a total mischaracterization, like I, like I was emphasizing. And even within, say, the Gulf monarchies. Uh, within this. So when Xi Jinping came to Abu Dhabi in 2018 and upgraded China or the UAE's relationship from a strategic partnership to a comprehensive strategic partnership, that took, that took the UAE from the second rung to the top rung. Um, they had signed in 2012 this, this uh, second tier partnership agreement. Um, a few months later, the Emir of Qatar went to Beijing for a state visit. Now, he'd also had that second tier relationship. And I think the expectation was, like, hey, I want an upgrade too, like the, the, the Emirati guys got. And he didn't. What he got was, yeah, this, this, this thing we have is working really well. Let's continue with that. And this kind of comes back to the Xinjiang question because um, Qatar is the only Gulf country to remove its name from that list. Now, I think what happened was, I think Qatar probably wanted that kind of recognition that the UAE received, especially given its isolation within the Gulf. Uh, I think China recognized that it had much deeper interests with the anti-Qatar bloc of the UAE, Saudi, Bahrain, and Egypt, and didn't see any point in antagonizing those countries, especially the UAE and Saudi. Um, so, you know, you see this differentiation uh, of, of how China sees the Gulf countries. Now, there's no document that says this. It's just you watch how these things play out over time and you, you can kind of make an inference. Um, but, but it seems quite clear that Qatar was dissatisfied. Um, it hasn't gotten a lot of new contracts since 2017, whereas the UAE and Saudi and Oman and Bahrain have been getting better stuff. Um, so there is kind of a, you know, when you say the Gulf, uh, you're right, it can mean a lot of different things. But I, I think if you look at the countries that have the highest level of partnership agreement in the Gulf, it's Iran, Saudi, and the UAE. Now, even among that, I would argue that they're not all weighted equally as I have. Um, and it's not what you think. I think the UAE is the most important. Um, they get a lot more, their, their, their economic relationships with the UAE are much more mature, much more sustainable, much more well-rounded with the UAE than any country in the Middle East. And in fact, the French showed me some data. And if you extend the Middle East, the Gulf, all the way to the, to the Mediterranean, the only country 
in that, that, that configuration that has deeper economic relations with China is France. You know, so that puts the UAE at number two, right across the Mediterranean as well. So, you know, the Gulf countries, there are, there, there are different ones, but, uh, um, you know, also the UAE has between two and 300,000 Chinese citizens, you know, which is also very unusual. So, um, yeah, you, you can look at it and you can think there, there, there are two or three tiers. Um, the bottom is Bahrain, because they don't have any kind of agreement. Um, the next, the next one would be Iraq, Kuwait, Oman, uh, and Qatar, because they have the second tier status, and then those three others are at the top. But then you could even say at, at the top, there's top A and top B. Now, as to the question about Xinjiang, uh, this is important and it's it's interesting, and and again, it's not something you're going to really see any kind of official statement from anybody. Um, but when the the Crown Prince of of Saudi uh, went to China last for his last round of this, this cooperation or this, this committee uh, meeting. Um, the timing was interesting. It was shortly after uh, Jamal Khashoggi was killed. Um, mm -hmm. And of course we remember when, when, when Mohammed bin Salman went to the US and he was hanging out with Bill Gates and Martha Stewart and Donald Trump and all of these great celebrities. Um, and, and shortly after that, uh, the US immediately said, we're done with you. You know, and you've got senators saying they, they've got to get rid of the guy and he can never come back. Um, well, he went instead to Pakistan, India, and China, and he was treated like a future king. And one of the consequences of that was in China, he, he issued a statement saying, China is dealing, with, I'm, I'm, this isn't verbatim by any stretch, but something like, China has the right to deal with um, ideological extremism in any way that it, it sees fit. If, if they can handle... Um, this politicization of Islam in a constructive way, then maybe we can learn something from them. Now, I'm not saying I agree with that by any stretch at all, but if you look at a lot of Gulf countries, um, again, looking at this regional security complex um, framework, one of the biggest threats I think that, that most governments in the region face is ideological. And a lot of that comes from political Islamic groups like the Ikhwan or Muslim Brotherhood, um, which in a lot of Gulf countries is considered a, an extremist organization and it's illegal. So when, when Chinese government says Xinjiang is our way to deal with, you know, this, this radical Islamic ideology, which I think is not a, a fair characterization, but that's how China frames it, that resonates. Um, and, and Gulf leaders will say, look, if, if maybe, uh, Maybe you have the, the ticket, what, the, what other countries have done with the war on terrorism or, or Muslim bans isn't working. Maybe this re-education thing will. Now, again, as, as a Western liberal, I find the, the idea pretty awful, but um, I'm not the, I'm not the uh, target audience, right? Uh, no. A lot of folks don't think it's uh, a horrible idea. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. Um, mm. I want to bring in a couple of uh, questions, uh, or maybe more than questions, because we're getting some on Facebook as well. Um, so some of the questions uh, are kind of related to each other, uh, which is in relation to the sanctions on Iran, how are they impacting trade between Iran and China, for example, in terms of banks, shipments, uh, lines, etc. Uh, and then the other one uh, is a question to the you know, about Chinese uh, strategies. Why isn't it interested in reshaping uh, and extending its sphere of influence in the Gulf states? Um, and so if you might answer those uh, that are, you know, kind of much more, um, yeah, uh, in a sense, in, in terms of uh, the sanctions on Iran, whether you have any comments on that, and in terms of uh, why isn't China interested in reshaping uh, the political spheres uh, in the Gulf states as the United States would have done. Right, so to the second question, I think they're not interested just because they've got a great deal as it is, right? The US has this, this security, excuse me, a security framework and, um, you know, it provides an umbrella for all these Chinese citizens and assets to be safe without any kind of security commitment. Um, I don't think that's a long-term um, long-term viable 
option, but it's worked very well, not just for China, but for everybody. You know, there's not too many other countries except Turkey and the UK and France that have committed any kind of true presence and they've got nothing uh, similar to what the US does. Um, you know, so Japan, for example, or, or Korea uh, have very intense domestic pressures that prevent them from projecting power. So they, they kind of rely on this US umbrella and, and, and China has as well. Um, I think there's a couple of points to this. One for, for um, you know, will China do this forever? Probably not. The trade war is the US weaponizing trade, right? It's, it's, it's China supply chains, it's, it's, it's energy um, potentially being cut off. So I can't imagine that they would be content to allow this to, to continue, like uh, you can expect to see that this um, supply base in Djibouti might might expand into something more than a supply base in this port uh, commercial or, or whatever it is in, in Gwadar in Pakistan um, might be more than a listening port um, in the future. Um, but I think another issue is that looking at it from the perspective of Gulf countries, um, every GCC country save Saudi has either a defense cooperation agreement or a facilities access agreement with the US. Um, and those are basically the, the, the load bearing pillars of their, their security policies. If China comes to Oman and says, yeah, we're investing in this port in Dukum and we'd like it to also be a dual purpose naval facility uh, the Omani government is going to realize immediately that this threatens their most important, you know, uh, extra regional relationship. Um, and it would put tremendous strain on, on, on the Omanis. So I think China is probably also saying it, it you know, what do I get out of this? Uh, if, if I, if I, I'll, if I just go along with it as it is, the U S is going to bear the, the burden of, of providing the security and I don't have to strain my uh, relationships with these countries that would that don't want to say no to me um, and don't want to uh, alienate the US either. So it just kind of seems like a, a very polite uh, response, maybe. Mm. Thank you. Um, so there are a couple of questions. I'm going to take one from Facebook, uh, which is a question on what role um, and side does China take in regard to the embargo against Qatar by the other Gulf states? Because this relates to another question coming from Mohammed Al Hajri on uh, the chat box, which says, How do you see the de development of relations of Arab Gulf states, and presumably amongst them, uh, under the, uh, uh, the uh, BRI, under the uh, Belt and uh, Initiative or Group Initiative? So I guess, you know, sort of, in a sense, is there this type of influence on internal regional relations? So the Qatar, <clears throat> excuse me, the Qatar issue was, was disruptive for China because they were in the process of, of trying to complete a free trade agreement with the GCC. And this is something they've been trying to work on for, for years. And uh, it was kind of characterized by fits and starts. They would you know, work on it and then there would be no, you know, one side or the other would say, no, we don't, we're not ready to expose our markets to Chinese, you know, retailers or whatever, or, or China doesn't want to, it's, it's energy uh, downstream to compete with Gulf ones or, or whatever. They, they just kept saying no. Um, in 2016, when, when Xi Jinping went to Saudi, um, he said, let's, let's get this done in a year. You know, I want, I want this free trade agreement they, they managed to uh, get past a lot of the uh, reservations that everybody had, had. And I think there was like five rounds of talks that year um, with the goal of 2017 being the announcement of this FTA. So when the business of the cutter started, you know, that was it. All the momentum was gone because you can't negotiate a multilateral agreement with an organization that doesn't exist anymore, right? Um, so I think for China, it was quite... Uh, disturbing. Um, they didn't say much publicly. They, they kept saying we're willing to mediate, which everybody knows means nothing because China had no role in this. Um, this was, you know, completely uh, uh, facilitated, I guess, by, by um, 
the Trump meeting in, in Riyadh, um, and there wasn't much China could do to, to walk it back. Um, so, you know, uh, publicly, they said all the stuff they're supposed to say, oh, this is terrible. We, we hope that they can find a peaceful resolution, a diplomatic solution, and we're willing to, to help if we can. But then, like I said, um, they, they've been working economically a lot more closely with Egypt, Saudi, and the UAE. And, and, the, and, and Qatar has kind of been a bit left in the cold. So it kind of looks like they've, they've picked their side in that particular um, struggle. Um, and maybe how, how the Gulf states, I'm, I'm not sure the question about the Gulf states and the BRI, uh, but I guess that's kind of similar in that um, a lot of these projects that you see happening in the Gulf seem to be in competition with each other. You know, like how many premier ports do you need um, in, a, in a relatively, well, I shouldn't say a small spot. I mean, that's a mischaracterization. Uh, I keep seeing people refer to like Oman as the tiny sultanate. And I'm like, nobody says Italy is tiny, but Italy and Oman are basically the same size. Nobody says Austria is tiny, but Austria and the UAE are basically the same size. But to have a bunch of ports, I guess, in, in sparsely populated areas with not a lot of urban centers seems a little unusual. But then you look at what a lot of these countries have for their development projects, and you can see that there is this, you know, when I came to Abu Dhabi in 2006, there was an enormous gap between Abu Dhabi and Dubai. That gap has shrunk, shrunk considerably. Like I see a point in the not too far future where it's basically just one big urban center um, that and, and in that case, you could see why maybe they do need two big ports to, to service these two big population bases. So um, there does seem to be a lot of overlap in what they're doing in these BRI projects. They seem to be competing with each other for Chinese um, projects. But the other important thing to consider is that the BRI isn't some top-down initiative out of China. This is a series of projects that are being rolled out under this BRI framework but a lot of them are being developed at a, the municipal or provincial level. And what you'll see in the, in the Gulf, for example, is that in Dubai, a lot of the, the Dubai um, Chinese commercial presence is from uh, Fujian province or Wenzhou. And then you come to Abu Dhabi and it's from Jiangsu province. And then you go to Oman and it's Ningxia province. And what, what happens is these provincial consortiums in, in China will look at the map, I assume, and say, hey, there's a place where there's not many Chinese businesses and they need infrastructure and they need this stuff and let's get together and build it. And they'll just go and say, oh yeah, by the way, this is Belt and Road. So it's not like, you know, Xi Jinping is sitting there with this great map saying, ah, this is where I'm going to put a port and here's I'll put a pipeline. I think a, a lot of these are very loosely coordinated, if at all. So. Um, I think a lot of Gulf countries see it as opportunities to get FDI. They see it as opportunities to build um, closer economic relations with a, a major rising power. Um, and I think they also see it as insurance, you know, should the U.S. really uh, um, decide that it does want to play a, a lesser role here. Okay. Um, there's a question from Bruce Daniels, uh, which asks about the if you could comment on the Israel, uh, China, UAE investment survey, surveillance tech, policing, urban control, uh, including private security companies and so on. So whether that's part of your research or not, uh, or whether you could comment on it, uh, given. Sure. It's not really, it's something I, I'm actually, a project I'm, I'm planning to start pretty soon because it's, it's clearly something that's really important. Um, China announced in 2014 yet another clunky named um, initiative called the one plus two plus three cooperation framework. And this was how they wanted to develop ties with different Arab countries. And they, they specified Arab. So, you know, Turkey and Israel and Iran technically aren't part of this, but you can see how Israel has, has kind of uh, become a bigger part of it. Um, the one and the two are, are pretty traditional. You know, one is energy, two is, um, trade investment and construction and infrastructure. But three is looking at things like digital cooperation, uh, renewable energy and um, um, nuclear energy. 
And the digital, of course, is what's been, I think, causing a lot of friction between China and the US. Because again, this digital stuff, whether it's Huawei 5G networks or whether it's AI cooperation or whether it's selling surveillance tech, um, this stuff isn't neutral. It, it, it's not apolitical. And it does present security challenges for the US military or the US Air Force or Navy or whatever. Um, so you can see why America does have some pretty legitimate questions about how closely these countries are cooperating with, with China on this stuff without maybe discussing it a little more closely uh, with their, their biggest um, security partner. Um, but again, um, the US has been, has been complaining a lot about this stuff, but they haven't really offered a lot of alternatives. That's starting to change where you can see Ericsson or other Western companies come in and say, you know, with their, what is it, their, their clean, uh, clean tech solution. Um, they're, they're, they're starting to try to address this, but that kind of ignores the fact that China's already got like a good five or six year head start on this. And um, at the same time, when you look at the, the, the interesting way that uh, Mr. Stanley phrased, uh, phrased this with Israel, China, and the UAE, you know, um, we've seen that when Secretary Pompeo went to, to Israel in May and said, you can't cooperate with China on, on sensitive issues and American uh, officials in, in the UAE uh, re reiterated that point, um, it seemed that, that the US was telling these countries, cool it, we don't want you working with China on, on, on things that we consider um, dangerous. Of course, this is happening when the US is completely overrun by COVID-19 and has no material aid to give anybody, um, let alone its own citizens. Meanwhile, China's coming to the UAE and building uh, you know, uh, COVID hospitals and providing PPE and, and working with them on testing and tracing and apps and, um, and, and, and building these huge testing centers and doing the same thing with Israel. Um, so this massive Chinese AI firm um, came to the UAE last year and signed this this MOU, and they've been working on this uh, on this uh, vaccine together, and they've also been working with the Israelis on it. And it's not just vaccine stuff, but they're also using this to develop uh, cooperation in AI, and other advanced medical cooperation, and um, a lot of tech cooperation. So. Um, it is a pretty real um, dynamic, and it's it's interesting because again, you know, the UAE's bought a lot of surveillance equipment from the Israelis. Um, it's been kind of indirect until recently. They buy Israeli companies operating out of Switzerland would sell it to the UAE, but um, you know they they've been working very closely on this, and Chinese companies have also been working very closely on this. And again, that's where I think this normative element of the relationship is important because, you know, a, a German or a Canadian or American company might have certain constitutional or, or parliamentary restrictions on how it can export some of this kind of tech, uh, but Chinese companies don't. And, um, you know, uh, uh, companies in the UAE are, are just happy to get the stuff. They don't want to have a, a liberal government wagging its finger and saying, we'll give you parts of it, but we won't give you all of it. And don't use it to stuff for stuff that makes us feel uncomfortable. Whereas China will just say, "Yeah, we'll sell it to you. We'll help you build it." Um, you know, we have no reservations at all. So there is a lot more cooperation on this type of thing than uh, than I think you'd expect, and and I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. So in relation to that, there are a couple of questions. Uh, I'm sorry, for some of the audience members. I'll come back to your questions, but one from Sardar. Uh, which is uh, how does China see the Abraham Accord and can China maintain neutrality and apolitical relations and obviously talked about the vaccine uh, and so on. Uh, but again, uh, what is the role of uh, Russia uh, in, in this situation and how extensive do you see the role of Israel being in the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the Belt Road Initiative and how does that affect countries in the region? You know, I think it's a kind of a complicated question from Matthew, but 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 it is you know sort of trying to think of this kind of shifting shifting relations and 
it's not it seems to be quite fluid rather than uh, you know a static position but perhaps you could you know you're, you're yeah on. so there was there was a lot of really interesting analysis that that talked about how the Abraham Accords were really going to stifle a lot of a lot of China's ambitions because this meant that um, you know trade flows would be happening intra-regionally whereas you know uh, I think we all know that the Middle East is notoriously pretty weak at interregional trade and, and tech transfer and there's a lot of competition between countries so the idea that you know Israel and Bahrain and the UAE are going to start um, building these kind of networks and it's been really impressive to me to see how how quickly this has happened um, and, and how much uh, energy has been kind of unleashed in doing this um, you know maybe this does create fewer opportunities for for Chinese companies but again um, just look at the volume and look at the size you know China's a 14 trillion dollar economy it's going to be pretty hard for Israel and the UAE and everybody else in the region to compete with it so I don't really see it as they're going to shut China out of the market. Um, I think really what, what this presents is an opportunity. I mean, if I were in Beijing and if I were consulting the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I'd be like, hey, this is great. Because, you know, going through uh, up the Red Sea through the Suez Canal to access the Mediterranean is pretty dodgy because the Egyptian government always looks like it's in trouble and, and, and uh, you know, uh, Somalia has been a, a nightmare and Yemen's a problem. But if Israel is suddenly a normal country um, in relation to its neighbors, you can build all sorts of, uh, of um, access points to get to the Mediterranean through Haifa, which, you know, this Chinese port company has a contract to manage. So you can see how this kind of red med project could actually start to take shape and how, um, you know, a country that geostrategically hasn't been a piece suddenly becomes available to some of China's ambitions. Now, the only issue, of course, is that obviously Israel's relationship with the U.S. Um, means that there, there's always going to be a limit. You know, when I was talking earlier about these comprehensive strategic partnerships, um, Israel doesn't have one because if they called it a partnership, then it would be you know problematic for everybody. So. I can't remember right now what they called it, but they gave it a completely different name to neutralize it so it wouldn't alienate the Americans and it wouldn't alienate the Palestinians, who China historically has tried to show that as a, a, a third world leader, it was going to support the Palestinians. But of course, their commercial interests have made that a little less uh, concrete. So there's another question which, which might be related to this from uh, Flavius. Uh, regarding the Chinese central bank revealing plan about the sovereign digital currency and whether that could be seen, you know, whether the Chinese currency will be in competition with the U.S. currency uh, in terms of gulf uh, exchange rates and so on. So in a sense, would the Chinese currency become the, uh, the default currency uh, for uh, trade deals and so on? Huh. Futuristic question, but might be: um, Do you expect to see a competition between petrodollar and yuan, for example? Um, yeah, I mean, really, if I try to answer financial or economic questions, I just sound really dumb. But uh, because I don't understand economics, it all just seems like witchcraft to me. But mm -hmm. um, you know, there's always been that tension um, of, of um, especially with the Saudis, that. Um, you know, the, the petrodollar is, is seems like a, a weapon that they maybe could use. Like when, when the Saudis were having some problems with America, they said, you know, maybe we'll we'll sell our, our American debt and we'll start buying, selling oil and, and, and yuan. Um, I, I don't see that happening, mostly just because Gulf leaders, most of their investments seem to go, um, you know, in, in U.S. currency. Um, but certainly for things like digital payment, and digital currencies and, and uh, um, this kind of new stuff that I clearly don't understand. China does this better, a lot better so far than a lot of other countries do. And, um, you know, Dubai, for example, has been working pretty closely with China, I think, in developing this, this uh, digital currency system and, and digital payment systems. Thank you. Um, so there's a question on Facebook and there's a last question that I want to take because it's, uh, it seems to be 
dropping to the moment. Uh, but the one from Facebook is from Thailand. And uh, do you think with the deteriorate, deteriorating uh, US-Chinese relations and the focus on domestic economy in China, is China ready to sacrifice its relations with the US to serve geopolitical or economic interests? And then uh, do, perhaps we can see evidence from the Wiley uh, trade with Iran despite the sanctions. Um, and you answer the question about COVID. But the last question from uh, coming uh, in the question and answers is how would it change in US foreign relations back towards a rules-based international order, say in the case of a Biden victory, affect the Gulf and China equation? Um, mm that maybe push Gulf countries further into China's embrace. And I think this is kind of a topical question perhaps to end with, uh, but if you could answer those, um, other, you know, that other question about the deteriorating re relations and impact on, um, on, on China's uh, attitude or kind of strategies going forward. Yeah, I'll try. I mean, the first question about, um, the focus on domestic economy and if China is ready to sacrifice um, its relations with the U.S., I, I don't, I, I, I just don't see that happening. I think, I think that China. I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm naive or, or just an optimist, but those two countries are just so closely linked, and you, we, we keep hearing this phrase uh, decoupling, and it just I, I just don't understand. What that means. I mean, how can they? How can they isolate each other? They're they're just so deeply connected, not just directly uh, bilaterally, but through supply chains and through everything else. So it really seems. Um, I, I I just see this as political posturing more than anything, where where people trying to get votes or people trying to talk tough, you know, um, are, are are, you know, playing up to a domestic audience. I hope that's what it is, because otherwise. We're in worse shape than I think. Um, and I guess the last question about Biden in the Gulf, I mean, that's what everybody's wondering is, is what will this mean? Because um, there is a sense that, that a Biden administration would be a continuation of an Obama one, which I think is, is probably also quite simplistic. You know, uh, Joe Biden was uh, on the Senate um, Foreign Relations Committee for a long time, and, and I think he's probably a a more um, deeply strategic um, foreign relations thinker than Obama was uh, when, when he came into the office. Um, but there is a sense in the Gulf that, that uh, maybe certain countries have, have aligned themselves a little too closely to the Trump administration and the Republicans. And that goes not just in the Gulf. I mean, look at Netanyahu, um, he's really, you know, burn down any kind of relation with the Democratic Party that he ever had. Um, so, for a lot of folks in the region, I have to think they're 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 sweating right now, and thinking, you know, what will Biden mean for us? Um, I think in in Saudi Arabia, there's there's quite a lot of concern that um, the relationship between between the Saudi government and the American government has been very very narrow under the Trump administration. It seems to be an elite level. More than more so than before, where it really seems to be just uh, you know Jared Kushner talking to Mohammed bin Salman seems to be the extent of it, and a lot of those other important political ties, you know, in the Senate and in Congress have have been really uh, left to fray. But I, I do also think that they're pretty important uh, relationships for everybody. So I can't imagine that there wouldn't be quite a lot of energy to uh, make a course correction and try to, to bring some energy to, to fixing it just because it is, you know, it's a strategically important region for everybody. And despite, you know, American politicians saying they want to get out of the Gulf or they want to get out of the Middle East, um, I really think this is also just politi uh, political. Uh, the troop numbers aren't changing, the arms sales aren't changing, the bases aren't going anywhere. And, you know, it's sure, maybe America doesn't need the oil the way they used to. Maybe they don't have to worry about Israel the way they used to. Um, but at the same time, um, the American alliance system um, is supported largely through you know, Middle Eastern energy going to countries like Japan and Korea and, and energy going to, to Europe. So 
you know, if, if the U.S. were to say we're not going to have any role in, in securing that anymore, well, who will? You know, uh, a lot of America's allies, which is, the, I think, one of the most important sources of its, its global power, suddenly have to provide this for themselves. Uh, we get a lot more dangerous, fluid um, Middle East and Indo-Pacific becomes much more competitive. And, uh, you know, then we truly are dealing with great power competition. So my expectation would be that um, hopefully calmer heads prevail and they look at things not emotionally, but strategically and think, okay, this is politically not very, uh, the medicine doesn't taste good, but it's going to help us. So we're going to have to uh, approach it in a, in a certain way. Okay, well, we must end here. I know there are some questions that haven't been answered, but they kind of relate to each other. Um, but what I wanted to, um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Eki, for putting that. Very, very quick comment or question. Uh, do you cover in your book uh, whether uh, China is trying, you know, would strategically would like to try or want to play a role in mediation uh, between, let's say, Iran and the Gulf, state, the Gulf Arab states? Uh, do, you, do you talk about that um, in, your, in your book? Just it's my personal interest, just in case. Yeah, it's, it's kind of similar to the Qatar thing. They've, they've made the offer. And um, this was around the time when things got really, really bad. So after Nimr al-Nimr was, was um, executed, and then uh, there were these uh, attacks on the Saudi embassy in Tehran, and, and it really looked like things were getting uh, out of hand. And the Chinese foreign minister did make the offer uh, to say, look, we have good offices in both countries. We have a comprehensive strategic partnership with both countries. Um, you know, not too many other countries have that type of relationship in both cities. So they said, you know, we're willing to to offer some kind of mediation if you if you would like. But I don't think there's any appetite in Iran or Saudi for that at that time. And mm -hmm. I don't think they saw China as the actor who was going to solve it. I think they, they saw China as, you know, thanks for thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. We'll, we'll call you, you know, later. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and thank you so much for all the questions and apologies for not being able to, to get to them. Uh, but you could see how interesting your talk has been, uh, John. Oh, thanks. You know, uh, good questions came up and yeah. really look forward to reading your book, uh, The 2020, and uh, learning more about uh, diplomacy, international relations, and uh, strategies and the BRI. Um, but thanks a lot, and uh, thank you, Nargis and Aki. And we see you all soon. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. <laughs>